cannibal furries. Just let that thought take hold. Swish it around for a bit. Get a feeling for it. It's a great premise, isn't it? Really grabs your attention. Activates the imagination. Cannibal furries. Picture it. Hey. Not that kind. No. We're talking dead-eyed, uncanny, humanoid animals. Gore sloughing from their fuzzy, blood-drenched maws as a second, hidden mouth ravenously devours its prey. Cannibal furries. This is the premise promised by the new Image Comics comic, Plush. So I have notes. That's right, it's time to listen to a terminally online gay furry rant about why I found this comic to be deeply frustrating to read. But instead of settling for just being petulant, I'd also like to do something constructive here. So, whenever something in Plush's portrayal feels off, I'm going to then take a moment to try to explain what furries are actually like. And I guess I'll also review the comic on its own terms, though one perspective does bias the other. Alright? Alright. Our protagonist is a man named Devin who is heartbroken over his soon-to-be-terminated engagement. His fiance cheated on him, and is pregnant with another man's baby. So things seem pretty over. Strangely, his fiance is... a woman? That's... odd. Well, maybe he's bisexual, or she's... Trans? No, she's pregnant. Surely a story about furries wouldn't be about straight cis people, right? Let me back up a bit for anyone that's confused because they're used to a cis-heteronormative society. Furries aren't that. Furries are predominantly gay, lesbian, and bisexual. And they're also disproportionately trans, non-binary, pansexual, asexual, demisexual, and any other underrepresented sexuality or gender identity that comes to mind. Now, do straight, cis furries exist? Absolutely. But if regular society is 80% straight people and 20% queer, then the furry community is the inverse. About 20% straight and 80% queer. So, it's not that you're not allowed to have stories about a straight, cis, furry, but given how uncommon this premise is for a story, that would be a strangely non-representational choice to make, wouldn't it? In fact, I'd go so far as to say it's a missed opportunity, given how underrepresented non-allegorical queer stories are, and how rare it is for furries to exist as anything other than a joke. So right off the bat, if the protagonist of a furry story is straight, I can't help but think you may have missed the point? It quickly becomes clear that not only is Devin not gay, he's also not a furry. Devin is venting to his friend Levi, who is himself in full fursuit right now. Quite the reveal. I mean, bravo for being a shoulder to cry on for your friend, but damn, you were really in the middle of something, weren't you? Imagine fully suiting up as your fursona on the day of the convention, only to be stopped dead in your tracks for an hour as your friend pours his heart out to you. You're sweating your ass off because you're basically wearing a full-body carpet and your phone is blowing up the whole time. You don't want to check it. That'd be rude. But you just know there's a dozen friends and even a couple of hookups on Telegram wondering where the hell you are. Do you think he prepped? So, this guy seems like a great friend. Astonishing restraint. His fursuit is on point, by the way. Let's go ahead and gush about something that Plush gets right. The red and cream color scheme is a nice palette, at least in my eyes. The orange hair suits him, and the blue eyes and bandana pop while also drawing your eyes to his face. He's even got one of those goofy little tongues sticking out. Fun fact, those are often Velcro or magnetic so that you can pose them in different spots around the face. I do appreciate that the artist resisted giving the head different expressions, instead painstakingly recreating the same neutral expressions at several angles across multiple pages. Most fursuit heads cannot change their expressions, except protogens. The closest we can get is manually adding eyelids to shape the eyes, unless you're going full animatronic. Oh. And there's an internal view of the transparent eyes, showing how fursuiters can barely see in there. Part of the incentive to make them so big is actually for the safety of the user, since it increases their field of view. But what stands out most to me is the markings. Levi's suit has some very specific details that help him stand out from the 500 other canines that will be attending the same event. Both his tail and fingers are black. He's got this bright blue bandana, which also helps him hide the neck flap. But above all, he has these 
these multicolored squares circling one of his eyes. This is extremely common. Not these squares specifically, but the idea that a fursona would have a distinct marking that helps them stand out in a crowd. For example, here are a bunch of characters, but zoomed in so close that you shouldn't be able to tell who they are. But if you've been around in the furry community for a while, you're recognizing several of them right now, aren't you? Let me know in the comments. How many can you name? This guy must have really loved Metal Gear Solid V. Who is this joke even for? So, yes, A plus on the suit. Well done. Where Levi immediately begins losing points with me is when he decides that the solution to Devin's problems is to bring him to the furry convention. Levi? What are you doing, buddy? <sighs> okay, so let me take a moment to explain one of the cooler emotions I've felt over the last year. I woke up in a hotel in Rosemont, Illinois. It was the first day of Midwest Fur Fest 2022, the largest furry convention so far, and my first time being to one. As I threw open the curtains, waking Toaster in the process, I looked down to the streets below, and what did I see? Huge, colorful silhouettes on every sidewalk. The fursuiters were so far away, but with such distinct features I could identify their species at a glance. And they were everywhere. Suddenly I had this strange feeling in my chest, like a weight had been lifted that had been present for so long I had stopped noticing it was there. I had never been to Pride or a drag show or a gay bar and I'd only been out of the closet for less than a year. So this is my first experience as an openly gay man of being in a space where I was surrounded by people like me. Not only other queer folks, but furries as well. When I was in Vegas, I got the expanded experience as we moved on to venues outside of the smaller convention. At Hofbrauhaus, a fluffy dragon joined the conga line before getting bent over a table and spanked with a large paddle for a beer. I got to explore Omega Mart while being pretty sure I just saw Lemon Brat and Nonstop Pup roaming the halls. A local bar had a furry night where fursuit music videos were playing on every screen, and the menu had themed drinks riffing off of Vore and Musk. There's this beautiful, inverted sense that, at least for this weekend, the weirdos are the norm and everyone else is just gonna have to deal with it. It's a vacation away from societal anxieties and internalized shame. So once again, Levi... What. Are. You. Doing. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not gatekeeping furry conventions. You don't have to be queer to go to a convention. You don't even have to be furry to go to a convention. I brought Stephanie to Las Vegas FurCon. By all means, bring your friends. But bring your cool ones. You know, the ones that actually want to be there. I don't think that's a big ask. Stephanie is an extremely punk rock bisexual woman who craves novel experiences and literally got a new tattoo while she was there. She is not a straight, emotionally unstable, recent divorcee who doesn't even know what a fursuit is. But it's what comes next that's truly unhinged. Devin says, I don't have a uniform, or whatever you call those things. We call them fursuits, and you're in luck. I just happen to have an extra. What do you mean you have an extra? Do you have any idea how expensive a fursuit is? I mean, your mileage may vary, but a Lemon Brat full suit starts at $5,000. I realize that fursuits are the first thing people think of if you mention furries, but most people can't actually afford one. Yes, I do in fact know a few people who own suits for multiple fursonas, and I have seen people lend their suits out before, but that's usually because they love their character so much that they want to be able to interact with them from the outside as a separate person. It's like getting to meet your fursona. But that requires a certain level of trust and respect. This is a cherished possession. It can tear. It can stain. It has several pieces that can be easily lost. And if something happens to it, you're likely going to spend hundreds of dollars and several months getting it fixed or replaced. What I'm saying is that you're probably not going to hand it to your normie friend and just let him walk away in it. For perspective, this is like saying, oh, you're having a bad day, buddy? Well, don't worry. Here's 10 PlayStation 5s when your friend doesn't even play video games. What does Levi do for a living? I'm not sure about this, Levi. This doesn't quite feel like me. Ev, you need to let go a little bit. Tonight is going to change your life. No joke. Levi immediately roofies Devin and abandons him, presumably to go meet up with the friends that he's actually here to see. Seriously, we never see him again until the end of the story. 
I, I guess he wasn't a great friend after all. I'm really taken aback here, trying to place what they were going for with Levi's characterization. He's supposed to be the only regular furry in the entire comic, and what we got was bizarre. He's statistically likely to be queer, although it's never confirmed. He's a dude with seemingly more money than God, who drugs his friend with a substance that's worryingly primarily known for its use in sexual assaults, and then leaves him completely alone among a queer culture that he is not a part of, which is here to celebrate an online subculture that he knows nothing about. If we assume that all of the more distressing implications were unintentional, then this setup was ruthlessly utilitarian at the cost of any and all coherency. To get into the author's head for a moment, he likely wanted to have exposition about Devin's failed relationship, he wanted to have him be in a fursuit, and he wanted him to have substances in his system so that he would doubt whether what happens next is actually real. Now, I understand that floppy comic books are very short. They don't have the space to just drone on and on, like I do. 22 pages is nothing, so you have to find ways to set things up efficiently. But by having one character facilitate all of these unrelated elements and then promptly leave the story altogether, not only does that character come out feeling confused, but any time spent on him was essentially wasted. Because he existed exclusively to make the story go somewhere, he didn't. Alright, so we're inside the convention now, and at first glance, things are looking pretty good. We've got a ton of fursuit designs on display of several different types of animals. I particularly like that they look like they were genuinely built by different companies and people. It's subtle, but you can tell that this guy's fur has been shaved down around the eyes. This is extremely common because the fake fur used to cover fursuits will be of uniform length, so you actually need to carefully shave it to give it shape and make the character's facial features more readable. This guy over here has a massive head and a tiny body because he's poodling, which is what you call it when someone just wears the head and maybe the paws but not the suit itself. It's cheaper, easier, and you don't overheat. Over here, this dinosaur thing looks like it has flat, simple eyes sewn onto its face, which can look fine from the front, but the illusion is broken in an unflattering way when viewed at an angle like this. But we might be seeing one of the solutions to this problem right here in the foreground. I'm not completely sure, but it kind of feels like they're both looking directly at the camera despite both of their faces being turned away from us. If this was done intentionally, then what we're looking at here is a costuming trick called Follow Me Eyes. The eyes are actually recessed into the face, leading to an illusion that makes it feel like they're looking directly at you instead of straight ahead. I'll let you decide for yourself whether the result is cool and lifelike or super creepy. So, we're off to a good start. But the more I look at this spread, the more it starts to feel off to me. I think the first thing that stands out is that everyone is just kind of facing the viewer, and then it dawned on me. This feels like PAX. They drew a nerd con. If you're used to gaming and media conventions, you're probably familiar with the huge crowds of people pushing past each other in order to get to the next booth or panel. These kinds of events are all about consumerism, waiting in line. You're on a schedule, and you try to maximize your time usage as if you're at Disneyland. If you go to a furry convention expecting a similar experience, you will be very confused. Oh, there are a few events to go to, probably a cool dance competition, and there's always a big room where a bunch of independent artists are selling their wares. But you will quickly run out of stuff to do, because these things really aren't the point. Oh man, I convinced my tax guy to write off my trips to Midwest Fur Fest and Las Vegas FurCon as research expenses. So, let the following be evidence in my defense if I'm ever audited by the IRS. Okay, so how do I put this? Furry conventions are more like a massive party for a population of queer people who are statistically more likely to have only ever had sex in hotels. But they have had sex. A significant percentage of every fur con is actually taking place out of sight, scattered among dozens or hundreds of room parties that are being held at every hour of every day. Some people actually just stay in one room the entire time and basically have the convention come to them. Like, I haven't been to a ton of conventions, but I don't think they usually have on-site rapid STI testing. Which I fully support, by the way. Obviously, none of that would be pictured here. But my point is that a furry convention is a social event, and that's not the behavior that's being depicted here. They should have drawn a party, 
You know, a room that's not packed with scattered individuals, but several small groups. Circles of people chatting, nervous fans saying hi to artists that they admire, fursuiters taking photos together. Here's a funny detail about fursuiting. When you're inside one, it's very hard to communicate. You can barely see or hear, and your voice is muffled. So when fursuiters talk to each other, they tend to lean in incredibly close, like students whispering secrets to each other. It's actually really cute. Suitors may also become very physically affectionate. There's lots of hugging, petting, and even cuddling. It's not uncommon for fur piles to form in lower traffic rooms, where a bunch of people all just lie down together. This is because a fursuit isn't only a costume, it's also a textured, sensory experience, both from within and without. Listen, some dudes just want to be the little spoon. For a seven-foot-tall werewolf. Just remember to always ask for permission. When I look at these pages, there's a sense that the artist learned how to draw fursuits, but didn't really have any idea what they'd actually be doing. The talent is there, but it's lacking context and direction. There are also way too many fursuits to be accurate. They might be considered to be the core of the experience, they take up a lot of space and draw a lot of attention, but as I pointed out previously, not everyone can afford one. In fact, even the fursuiters themselves will often only be in character for a few hours per day because the costumes are cumbersome, inconvenient, hot, and potentially even dangerous to be in for a long time. Last year, the registration line for MFF was literally hours long, and when I got to the front, there was an unconscious suitor being tended to by medical personnel. Be aware of your limits. We're also missing the common alternatives to fursuits. Like, where's the twink with the bulldog harness, the pup mask, and full-body lycra suit with painted-on abs? I can't wait to explain to my tax guy how this is also a business expense. So there are a lot of alternate costumes at furry conventions, either to celebrate queerness in other ways, or to earn some cheaper DIY anonymity. And I hate to keep banging this drum, but once again, the only visible couple is seemingly a straight one. This man with his arm around a woman who, by the way, looks way too dressed up for this venue. Anyway, this page is both the first and last we see of the furry convention. That was fast. Ugh, my head is huge. Ugh. One size fits most never means me. Fuck, it's hot in there. <laughs> right, where were we? Devin was roofied, remember? So he pushes his way outside into an alley to throw up. But he's not alone. First his glove disappears, and then cannibal furries, and they're eating another fursuiter right through the suit itself, which seems really hard to do, honestly. But hey, not the worst villain introduction. I've read enough Junji Ito to respect the way this comic deliberately uses the page turn to reveal it all at once in a two-page spread. A spread is meant to make an important image more impactful and memorable by blowing it up over two pages. So it makes sense that the two spreads so far will be the ones with the furries and the ones with the cannibals. This is the Cannibal Furries comic, after all. Unfortunately, from this point on, the presence of any actual furries is... a bit up for debate. But more on that later. And there will never actually be another act of cannibalism ever again. No, I'm serious. And we're only halfway through the first of six issues. This is a bit of a problem for a horror comic. You'd think that that would be a source of tension. That at some point in the narrative, a named character would be threatened by the idea of being eaten alive, but... Nope. Not really. So, Devin runs away from Cannibal Furry Alley and somehow manages to run directly into a police officer, and... It's the exact guy who cucked him and got his wife pregnant. Really, like, what are the odds of that? I understand the need to be economical in your plotting when you only have 22 pages per issue, but I can't help but feel like these massive coincidences make the world feel incredibly small. We opened the story with Devin complaining about this guy, then went to an unrelated furry convention, then ran directly into the very man he was just complaining about? The only way that this city which I'll remind you is big enough to host a furry convention, could feel smaller as if the sheriff was his fiancé's dad. So anyway, the sheriff is his fiancé's dad. Devin is taken in by the police, and the sheriff wants the marriage to go through. 
despite the cheating, because Devin's parents are rich and he wants that connection to be forged between their families. He tries to force Devin to go through with the marriage by threatening to pin unsolved crimes on him, branding him as a sex offender. This scene? What they're doing here? Gives my analysis brain the tinglies. But we'll get to that. We end the issue with Devin sitting in jail, contemplating his fate. And honestly, I'm just kind of confused at this point. I mean, I'm genre savvy enough that I know that it's not strange that I was promised cannibal furries, but then only saw them for two pages of the first issue. It's extremely common to only hint at the horror elements of a story early on, hide the monster and all that. What I do find odd is what the creators have chosen to spend their time on instead. In a 22-page issue, we have three pages spent discussing the cuckening, two pages spent at the furry convention, two pages of cannibals, and then 11 pages take place either with the police or at the police station, largely spent litigating a straight marriage between a woman that we'll never meet and a guy who isn't even a furry. He doesn't even have, like, a pro or anti-furry disposition. He's furry agnostic, which means he doesn't even have any preconceived notions to be changed in a character arc, which means that the core of this story has nothing to do with the furries. So, I guess my question to you, dear viewer, is based on what you've seen so far, would you come back for the second issue? Would you be compelled to make a second, third, sixth purchase at a later date to keep up with this story? I personally bought them all at once, so I never had to make this choice, but I'm wondering if I would have continued if doing so was presented as a choice at this moment. Digging deeper into its issues, I'm struck by how the story doesn't expand naturally from Devin's character. I mentioned how Levi is rendered incoherent by his need to accomplish several things for the plot, but in truth, the same can be said about this entire first issue. The two established villains, the cannibals and the police, have nothing to do with each other, and one of them has nothing to do with Devin, so they have to contrive a reason for him to be around furries, inviting logistical bloat that could be easily trimmed by having him be a furry to begin with. Just start at the con. A thematic throughline is created with Devin's ring, but aside from that, you could completely swap out why the sheriff is so fixated on him to begin with without functionally changing most of the story, and you'd probably end up with a lot less to explain. For a horror story, we're given very little to work with. Devin has no pre-existing relationships with furries. He isn't freaked out by the premise of an anonymous human being lurking inside of a mascot costume, nor does cannibalism in any way relate to his anxieties about infidelity. So as much as the creator would like for me to be asking, so what happens next? I'm instead just asking, why? I think the misguided, confused nature of this book can be summarized in how it ends. With a prison joke. That prison joke. You know, the one that shames assault victims while also reinforcing homophobic stigmas surrounding same-sex activities. In a book about a queer community. Okay. The second issue might be the best in the series? The cops are beating Devin while he's in their custody, but the furries arrive and eviscerate them in a fun, stylized, very gory scene. It turns out they've come to rescue Devin because Bo, the goat man, thinks that Edie, the blue cat thing, fell in love with Devin at first sight. All right. I'm interested. I've watched at least a dozen horror comedies precisely because they had this kind of compellingly absurd premise written on the back of the box. In fact, it's compelling enough that I can't help but think that this is how the first book should have started. Seriously, the series kind of works better if you just skip the first one entirely. The relevant information is just repeated anyway. Which is not a great thing to say about a book that was entirely exposition and table setting, but here we are. Unfortunately, any momentum gained from the splash of action we had in issue 2 is quickly lost in 3 and 4. These issues are spent covering Devin's adoption into the found family the furries have formed in their mansion in the woods. An attempt is made to sell the idea that Devin and Edie really are in love with each other, but it just doesn't land. She usually wants nothing to do with him, and when they do finally hang out, he spends the whole time complaining about his ex? I don't understand why straight romance is constantly written like this, where the woman hates the man, but eventually succumbs to his raw charisma. Charisma that is more implied than shown because he's often barely a coherent character. Brushing our cardboard couple aside, honestly, the comic's greatest strength might also be its biggest problem. Bo. 
This guy is outgoing, wears his emotions on his sleeve, and is genuinely invested in how other people feel. He causes the entire plot to happen because he has an almost supernatural read on Edie's emotional state. He has the most defined personality, he develops the most believable bond with Devon, and this is all a problem because his character ultimately has nowhere to go. He has no arc, no journey to go on. But he eats up a lot of pages, presumably because the creators of this comic really love the guy. I just think that time might have been better spent giving Devin any kind of discernible personality. Anyway, the cops arrive and Devin surrenders himself to protect the furries, but the cops attack anyway. Issue 5 consists of Devin trying to break free while the furries are all mowed down. Edie is so heartbroken over Devin leaving that she has lost the will to live, despite having barely spoken with him. Devin makes it back just in time to stop. Ugh, <sighs> another sexual assault. It's then revealed that the furries had Kevlar in their suits, so they just get back up and pretty effortlessly slaughter the police in the final issue. The final confrontation is flashy, but ultimately lacking in weight because none of the characters in this conflict even know each other. The sheriff is the only one that really matters, and he bafflingly spends the fight monologuing Devin's character arc at us. An arc that has to be told because it hasn't been shown. One thing I never liked about you is your lack of a killer instinct. You're just too weak, Devin. Devin? Devin isn't here right now. Can't you read? What makes no sense to me here is that Devin hasn't really changed as a person. He was already standing up to the sheriff in issue one, and his first response upon seeing the cop his fiancée cheated with was to punch him. This moment is framed as character development, but really it seems like the existing conflict simply escalated into a life or death scenario. Is Devin capable of killing, if pushed to do so, is introduced as a question for the first time, literally in the panel before the one where he kills. Plush is ultimately a neat series of images to look at, but even when I put my queer furry nitpicking aside, I don't think it really functions as a story. Which is a shame, because I've read Smut that develops its characters better than this. Passing love is 30 pages shorter than plush and about 50% sex scenes, and yet I and every single other person who has ever read it would die for Travis. But now that we've got the whole summary out of the way, let's try to dig deeper. You might be thinking, hey, you're that guy who did that three-hour Beastars video where you argue that the cannibalism was allegorical. Is anything like that happening here? But I'm gonna have to disappoint you there. While it is very funny that I'm already doing another video about furry vor, I can't see anything meaningful going on here. What we're told is mostly a series of uninterrogated cliches, like when Edie says a fursona is like a spirit animal. When it comes to cannibalism, they say it's a sacred act, and that whoever you eat becomes a part of you forever. But the only person who ever gets eaten is some unnamed woman that they met off page. And this is not a story about Devin becoming worthy of being eaten, nor does he learn how or why to eat someone. So it's hard to extrapolate much from there. As Sigmund Freud once said, sometimes vor is just vor. I don't think any other video essay channel has used that word this much. Question. How do you pick the right... Persona. Well, how did you pick the one you're wearing? Oh, uh, I didn't. It's my roommate's? That was a horrible idea, Devin. Never let anyone else pick your persona for you. It should represent who you are at your best. Think of it as your spirit animal. I know I'm saying this about a character that is literally a cannibal, but... This interaction is strange. It's just not how someone who is familiar with furries would speak about this. First of all, letting someone borrow your fursuit is not picking your fursona for you. It's just a thing that people do for fun. It's a costume, not a sacred ritual. I know multiple people whose fursuits aren't even the same character as their fursonas. Pre-made suits are sold all the time, which obviously aren't going to look exactly like your character. They're expensive, but it's not like they're tied to your very being. It's cosplay. Sometimes literally. Fursonas also aren't required to be self-representative. There are true sonas, sure, which are meant to be a more direct representation of what if me, but a hyena. But they're just as likely to be whatever you're attracted to or 
a literal deity or that Hrothgar that you made in Final Fantasy and got someone to draw that one time. Some furries have no fursona, while others collect dozens of them. There are no rules. That's not to say that she's wrong about the you at your best bit. Given the freedom to create whatever you want, of course plenty will create a character that represents their personal goals, be they fitness or gender expression. But people don't inherently have an animal inside them, and calling them spirit animals feels a bit too much like a bit of cultural appropriation. Feel free to just pick the first one that comes to mind. If you decide you don't like it, you can just change your mind later. Honestly, this entire page just feels kind of contradictory anyway, since Devin ultimately kills the sheriff with a unicorn head that he found, meaning he's wearing someone else's fursona in the climax anyway. Even the name, Princessa Sassy Pants, comes from a shirt he was given. Okay, we're overdue at this point to nail down a definition for what exactly a furry is, to contrast what the comic has presented. But first, if you're not a furry, what do you think a furry is? And if you are a furry, what does being a furry mean to you? Pause the video and let me know down in the comments. There are wrong answers, sure, but there's a pretty wide range of valid ones. Personally, if I had to boil it down to a few words, I would say that furries are a global, queer, countercultural art movement. The extent to which these words apply varies from person to person, but it's the best I've come up with at the moment. The focus on art is the most overtly obvious and requires little arguing from me. If you've ever encountered anything furry, it was via an art form, be it drawn, animated, written, performed, or Yes, the fursuits themselves, which are a massive artistic undertaking to craft. It's easy to take them for granted with how pervasive they are, so I just want you to stop and think for a moment about the fact that you've potentially seen hundreds or even thousands of these costumes, but you've likely never seen two that were the same. Every one of them took tons of work to create is a unique character, and exists as a monument to self-expression. That's a culture, one that connects thousands of people transcending both ethnicity and nationality. Suits aside, it's clear that the community congregates around artists. If you have a popular ongoing comic, and a recognizable suit of your character, you are a celebrity at conventions. But being constantly flooded with great art does something to people. It inspires them. I'd bet money that a disproportionate number of furries at least try to learn how to draw. I mean, how couldn't you? Just through exposure, you can't help but observe anatomy, sketching, perspective, shading, and since you have your own character, you'll inevitably end up imagining them in different scenarios, but won't always want to pay someone $200 to draw them. At the risk of embarrassing myself, you're currently watching me draw. Right now. I've been doing it since that Lego she video. And whenever I get stuck, there are always people ready to help me along. This might be what stands out most about fur cons. Nerds are used to conventions being about hype and consumerism, big announcements by Marvel and Nintendo, where you're basically paying to be advertised to. At a furry convention, the hype ceiling is just some dude going, Hey, look what I made. <laughs> people are sitting at booths with a stack of 20 art prints that might be the only ones that will ever exist. PAX West's showroom was the most crowded room I've ever been in but I mostly just wanted to leave the whole time. But I spent two days exploring the Midwest Fur Fest marketplace because I just had to see it all. The things to be discovered there were both more meaningful and more fleeting. When it comes to the counterculture bit, sure, you'll hear your share of A-cabs from outspoken anti-fascists. The most impassioned defenses I've heard of anarchism came from ex-military dudes who moonlight as femboy foxes and programmer socks. But I won't pretend that your average furry is necessarily politically minded. But the freak flag is a presence. These are invariably people who picked up a hobby, saw a world that often reacts negatively to their behavior, and then just kept going on anyway. It's no wonder so many furries are queer when you consider how compatible that narrative is with the experience of coming out, of being a person whose very existence is politicized, but must nonetheless face the world again every day. When you give up on the impossible standard of being normal, you're finally free to have fun. It's worth mentioning that there was actually an attempt to fight back against the queerness of the furry fandom back in 1998, the Burned Furs. Their mission statement began as thus. 
anthropomorphic fandom is being overrun by sexually dysfunctional, socially stunted, and creatively bankrupt hacks and pervs. It was very kink at pride debate, with furries being shamed for any depiction of fetishes in art or at conventions. But as is often the case when this argument resurfaces, the kind of people who fight against liberation and in favor of repression tend to be the very same folks that consider homosexuality and transgenderism to be among such fetishes. It was very apparent that the leadership of the burned furs was openly queerphobic, and that what they actually wanted was to shame furries back into the closet. You don't hear about the burned furs very much anymore, though. Why? Because the furry fandom is one of the few places where the LGBTQ plus community actually won. And I can't stress enough how important that is to the history of furries. Which is why it hurts so much to see a character like Keebler. While Edie is giving Devin a tour of the house, he spots a bald, muscular silhouette in the shadows. Wait, who is that? Oh, that's just Raymond. Well, you know him as Keebler. He takes care of everybody's suits. Don't be so judgy. He's just exploring his sexuality. It's no big deal. I wasn't. I... I just assumed Keebler was a female. She is. So, this short-circuited my brain. On one hand, in this story about furries, we finally have our first seemingly confirmed queer character. She's even shown wearing a Love is Love shirt in issue 4. But on the other hand, they made the only confirmed queer character the creepiest character in their story. And as far as trans representation goes, reading this page feels like falling down the stairs. Somehow, every single sentence manages to step on yet another rake. First, Edie immediately deadnames Keebler, which you should never do. I can't even come up with any logistical reason for why she had to say that. We, as the audience, don't benefit from knowing Keebler's dead name, and Devin has no reason to care about it. So why introduce a name you're not supposed to remember or use? Does the creator of this comic understand that trans people tend to change their names, but not understand that you're then supposed to forget the old one? I thought that Keebler was female, followed by she is, should be an affirming comment, but Edie correcting Devin falls flat when she opened the conversation by misgendering Keebler herself three times. This trio is a kind of found family. They've known each other since they were kids and seem to have this deep understanding and trust in one another. I assume this is just the author fumbling the subject because if not, it characterizes the love interest as someone who really doesn't respect her sibling's transition. The fumbling is compounded by the choice to show her naked. She's presented in a way that emphasizes her masculine appearance, the only nude form in the entire series and it's done in a way that makes her seem like a monster, stalking under cover of shadow. Given that this entire series is drawn in bright pastels, it really stands out that the trans character's true appearance is the only thing drawn in an overtly creepy way. How else are we meant to feel looking at this image? I myself am admittedly having to make some assumptions about Keebler in this section because the author also chose to make her non-verbal, as if he was uncomfortable writing a trans woman, so she never gets a chance to explain herself. This only works to make her seem all the more alien. And what's up with her suit, anyway? Despite everyone else wearing fursuits, it goes completely unquestioned that she's wearing the bikini model equivalent of one of those inflatable T-Rex costumes. Like it's a joke. Like she's a parody of femininity. Haley, a trans friend of mine who was also proofreading this section, immediately called out a transphobic trope. The idea that femininity is a costume that she just takes off at the end of the day, as opposed to a core element of her personality. This stinks of Norman Bates and Buffalo Bill, two characters that have infamously burned the image of men dressing up as and killing women into the public consciousness, despite both being confirmed in their own movies to not have actually been trans. He's just exploring his sexuality. Being transgender is not a sexuality. It's a gender identity. Saying that Keebler's gender presentation is her figuring out her sexuality implies that she presents as female not for gender affirmation, but as a kink. Haley brought up the Blanchard theory of autogynophilia, 
an idea that is weaponized transphobically to argue that trans women are just men who are aroused by the idea of presenting as women. I didn't want to think that that's where the author was going with this, but then I revisited issue 2 to find a scene where Keebler taunts her captive with what's going on between her legs. The implication seems to be that he, and by extension, we the audience, are meant to be repulsed by her anatomy. In a frankly brow-raising choice, even her kills are explicitly sexual in nature. In a story where the cis woman cuts people in half with her tail, the trans woman smothers two men, one with a kiss and the other with her breasts. Despite the furries being presented as vaguely sympathetic by the end, this behavior puts her more in line with the villains, who repeatedly threaten the women with sexual assault. And in one of these scenes, a man survives by hiding in the women's restroom. Were they implying something there as well? Or was this just a good old-fashioned heteronormative joke about emasculation? What I find extra frustrating about this whole mess that is Keebler is that the kernel of her character is so close to expressing something genuinely furry. It's time for some history. Did you know that the first ever fursuiter was a man presenting as a woman? Yeah, there's often this perception that furries became gay over time, but things were looking pretty queer from the start. It's January 1989, and the first ever furry convention is being held in the Holiday Inn in Costa Mesa, California. Conference Zero. It's the Rod O'Reilly Master Mix at Conference Zero. Robert Hill walks on the stage as Hilda the Bambioid, clad in thigh highs, and dances to R.E.M.'s It's the End of the World as We Know It, and I Feel Fine. The courage to do this in George Bush Sr.'s America. Hill had been a Disney cast member in the 70s, and helped pave the way for giving these mascot-style costumes a new purpose. I won't pretend to know his life story, and as far as I know, Robert Hill never came out as anything other than a cis man, but it was performances like this that opened the door to what we have today. The furry community is awash with gender exploration, including trans and non-binary identities. I personally know multiple trans furries who embarked on their journey of self-discovery via self-expression through characters and avatars. If you draw your own fursona, you might find the design drifting over time, a changing hairstyle differing body proportions. Maybe one day you swap their gender, just for fun. And maybe you chuckle to yourself and move on after that. Or maybe you end up with an image that you can't stop staring at. This character was your self-expression, but somehow it feels like you're just now seeing them for the first time. The idea takes hold, and suddenly you're realizing why you've always avoided mirrors, why you cut your hair that way, and why you wear such baggy clothes. You've found the answer to a question you didn't even realize you've been asking yourself for years, and are overcome by these dissonant feelings, by the euphoria of truly seeing yourself and the dread of how treacherous the path before you has become. When the rules and expectations surrounding gender relax because you found a community that properly embraces the variety of the human experience, there's room to find yourself. So by all means, Play with gender until the mortar gives out and no one knows how to put it back together. We'd all be the better for it. With Keebler, honestly, the bar for decent representation was so low here. She just needed to have her own regular feminine presenting fursuit, just like Edie's, instead of this worrying mess. And then, if we did end up seeing her out of suit, just let her be quirky, like Bo, the medieval weaponry vegan, instead of being the lone furry that's mysterious and monstrous. There are actually a lot of options for how she could have been drawn, even when taking into account the idea that she's meant to be trans in a way that's communicated visually. There's always AMAB androgynous, but she could also be a trans woman that doesn't pass at all. I've seen those Twitter threads. I know that there are plenty of people out there who feel seen and validated by art of women with broad shoulders and stubble so long as she's owning it. Just, for the love of God, give her actual lines, a personality, interrogate her inner world, and show that she's proud of herself. None of this shadowy Igor crap. She's a human being. Let her shine. They want to dress like animals? We're going to treat them like animals. The sheriff and deputy have gathered a whole squad of gun-toting cronies, and they're planning on hunting the furries down like one would a wild animal. This caught my attention because it's surprisingly familiar, like not literally, but ever since I came out, it's become a part of my daily routine to shadow ban all of the new comments on my videos by the anti-furries. There are, of course, the usual fatherless comments. 
which are a shitty thing to read the year that my father actually died. But then there are all the comments that just describe big game hunting rifles in great detail. Out of context, these just look like spam, but through repetition, in response to furry content, the intent becomes clear. They're describing the big game hunting rifles because they're implying that I personally should be hunted down and killed. It's a threat of violence that while anonymous and likely toothless over the internet, is meant to remind me that I will not be accepted. But moving beyond random online weirdos targeting an online figure, we have more distressing stories like the attack on Midwest Fur Fest in 2014. In the middle of the night, the host of the convention, Hyatt Regency Hotel in Rosemont, Illinois, was flooded with toxic chlorine gas. Thousands of guests were evacuated across the street, and 19 people were hospitalized. Authorities determined that this was a deliberate criminal act, and based on when and where it took place, I personally have no qualms about calling it what it is. Terrorism. Given what we know now, the reporting surrounding this event gets pretty hard to watch. 19 people were hospitalized at a furry convention in Il Illinois. What? Spread the... I think they had to evacuate the building and everything. Many still dressed in their furry, furry costumes. Like, I get it. I do. I make a living trying to be funny on the internet. I see the humor in the situation. Smash cut to very serious looking lion striking the rant Sona pose. But can we just agree that it's a bit grim that the takeaway of this segment was ha ha aren't furries weird? While 19 people hospitalized is plastered across the screen? There's something important about she this just world. <laughs> something that we all wish we didn't know. This year at Confuzzled in England, attendees were being harassed in public, some reportedly having rocks thrown at them. Local furries were warned to remove their fursuits or anything else that could identify them and to travel in groups for safety. This stuff worries me. I'm not going to say something stupid like furries are an oppressed minority, but several of the groups of people that themselves make up the majority of all furries are. I don't really believe at this point that people target furries just because we're weird, without any deeper understanding of who we are. Partly because it's just common knowledge at this point, but mostly because bigots are too stupid and unsophisticated to mask their true intentions. Are you scared of the furries or the back rooms? I'm scared of you guys in real life because all y'all call you gay. Shit, he caught us! So, let's call anti-furries what they actually are. The final bastion of socially permitted homophobia. A veneer of plausible deniability that wears thinner with each passing year. And in this case, we're talking about a furry convention. An event that I've already established is an expression of queer pride. A chemical attack meant to scare people away from attending future conventions is a way of telling us not to gather in public spaces. Assaults that lead to advice that we remove all queer identifiers from our person is targeted harassment with the goal of driving us back into the closet. This sucks. It's not a huge leap to assume that this behavior was encouraged by conservative propaganda. In the field of public opinion, they've lost the war against gay marriage. So now they've moved on to politicizing trans people and fear-mongering about furries. The goal is to frame these groups as corrupting threats that are out to get your kids. If a group can be categorized as a threat, then they can be dehumanized. And when you're no longer seen as a regular human, but something other, it becomes easier to justify violence. This is all to say that when I read the comic and spotted the visual motif of furries being hunted like wildlife, I found it to be if a bit obvious creatively, fairly compelling a choice. But then they went and gave the furries the exact same theme. You see, the furries have a whole room dedicated to displaying the fursuit heads of all of their conquests, like the heads of deer they hunted. Do you see why this comic is getting to me? Like, even if you throw away all of the projecting I just did, all of the potential context that I brought to the table, whether you felt it was relevant or not, why would you frame both sides of this conflict as one and the same? The entire comic hinges on us liking one group and hating the other, so how do you fumble such an obvious bit of predator and prey imagery? If you're gonna have Dave be rescued by this quirky found family, why muddy the waters by drawing such a parallel between them and the police? What thematic end does that serve? The more I look at this, the more it feels like they never planned out how they were going to square the idea that the cannibals are essentially the good guys. So they never deal with it. They never reconcile this imagery. It's just there. It's evocative, but with the goal of evoking what? I haven't really been nice for a while, have I? Surely there's something else I can praise in this comic. What did it do well? 
Well, the most heavily reinforced piece of symbolism in Plush is Devin's grandmother's ring. He was going to use it to propose to his girlfriend, but then she cheated on him, so throughout the story it represents the stolen promise of a certain and happy future. And he takes it out whenever he's stuck thinking about what could have been. I know those sentiments may be all sappy nowadays, but I desperately want what my grandparents had. That's what this ring means to me. Well, it used to. Don't do that, Devin. Don't let someone else take that from you. My father gave this to me the day he rescued me. When he passed, it hurt to even look at. But after a few months, it started to mean more to me than ever before. This is probably the most meaningful exchange in all of Plush, where Edie finally drops her guard and she and Devin have an actual conversation for a few short pages. The scene is about how we search for closure when things that once felt eternal are lost to us forever, and how symbols can grow and change when we mourn what they once meant to us. In his lowest moment, when Devin is surrendering himself to the sheriff, he makes a point to throw the ring away. This is him admitting that marching off to be married to his cheating ex is a betrayal to himself. She may have been the original intended recipient of the ring, but she is no longer worthy of it. Because to him, she no longer represents a happy future. This is why, when Bo sees the ring, he knows that Devin's departure was insincere. He puts it on the unicorn's horn to wait for Devin's return. When Devin achieves his final form by donning the mask, he's reunited with the ring, signaling that he's back on the right path. On the final page, as Devin is leaving all connections to his past life behind, he drops the ring, as if to say it's time to move on from pursuing the future it once represented. But when Edie asks him if he's ready for a new beginning, he retrieves it, the ring now representing a chance to start anew. It's bordering on heavy-handed, but the ring gives us a through line all the way from the first page to the last, with Devin's interactions with it summarizing his characterization. What's frustrating here is that Plush's most well-handled story mechanic is also its most queer. And as annoyed as I am that Devin himself is not, I do want to explore that a bit deeper. Devin's a good guy stuck in a horrible spot, exactly where Daniel and I want him. He's lived this normal, basic existence all his life. He's followed all the societal rules you're supposed to. Go to college. Find someone to settle down with. Respect your parents. Don't do anything to stand out. Strive to fit in and be normal. Yeah, we're gonna crush that idea of happiness. I was looking at interviews late in this project, and this quote really stood out to me, describing Devin as a color within the lines type of guy. To be clear, I don't think they actually characterized him this way on the page. We never get a sense of what he's like in his day-to-day -day life, and he spends most of the story being dragged from scene to scene without a ton of personality or agency. But still, there's a solid setup for a queer character in that premise. You know what? Just for the sake of argument, Let's just pretend Devin is gay. Devin is gay, a queer reading of plush. Just throw out the part where his entire motivation is based on a cheating girlfriend that we never even get to meet. Instead, we have a queer character facing a tough decision. Hell, the decision that's inherent to queerness. A turning point in the shared history of nearly every furry. Do you do what society expects of you, marry the girl, and live an unfulfilling yet uncontroversial life? Or do you abandon tradition? endanger yourself, and recklessly chase your happiness as one of the freaks. This makes Devin's connection to the furries make way more sense. They're his found family, his queer support network. Also, assuming Edie is a man in this hypothetical rewrite, this also helps explain why Devin falls in love so quickly with Eddie. He's the first man to ever return his affections, to see him as he really is. So of course they'd rush into a messy, poorly conceived, and likely short-lived relationship. Your first queer experience can be intense. He's like a hormonal teenager all over again, experiencing new firsts. But the sheriff is where the queer reading really gets to shine. This is a story where the police are the villains. The usual assumption that police exist to uphold some kind of justice never really comes into the picture. They are explicitly here only to enforce a power structure that benefits themselves. They will commit violence if they know that they can get away with it. And they collectively ostracize and bully the one cop that doesn't play ball. They are not an inherently moral institution. If there was a bad apple, then it has long since spoiled the bunch. The police being represented as villainous is oddly resonant for a comic like this because queer people have a history of tensions with the law. We as a community are under constant threat of being criminalized here in the United States, and one of the most common tactics for doing so is by constantly accusing us of being sex offenders. 
groomers. I shouldn't have to explain how many times Leave the Children Alone was trending during Pride Month this year. This is a calculated tactic. So, color me surprised when the sheriff has Devin in custody and is threatening to pin unsolved sex crimes on him if he doesn't marry his daughter. Coming from a place of authority, the ultimatum is clear. Give in to the cis-heteronormative expectations that society has forced on you, or be unfairly demonized for the rest of your life. This makes it all the more powerful when Devin dons the guise of the unicorn, the gayest of all fantasy creatures, and a pink one at that, and uses that form to kill the sheriff. Banding together and fighting back against authority and stigma by committing to queer self-expression? That's why furries exist! That's the whole point! If Devin is gay then he has a reason to take a leap of faith, leave life as he knew it behind, and join the freak show. His arc makes sense, and it's compelling. So do you see why I'm so frustrated with this comic? <laughs> I know that this dead horse is just glue by now, but why should I have to settle for allegorical queerness in a story about furries? All right, we're nearing the end here, so I just want to take another look at what else I found while I was reading interviews to find that previous quote. One last chance to clarify what exactly they were going for with this comic. As far as mission statement for Plush is concerned, my dream is to make the reader giggle quietly in the dark at things that make them uncomfortable, and maybe wince once or twice. One day, I was wasting my time away on the socials and bumped into a picture of a furry that immediately sent chills up my spine. I started giggling to myself when the thought of a group of furries hunting people would be hilarious to me. All right. Well, that doesn't sound great. <laughs> Chances that this was made out of any fondness for furries seems slimmer and slimmer. I find it strange, though, that the idea of being hunted by a pack of furries was never really mined for horror, nor comedy, despite apparently being the inspiration for the whole thing. There are spikes of furry violence, but... Not much in the way of tension or payoff. What kind of research goes into a series about furries? Luckily for me, I have quite a few friends in the furry community, so it was easy for me to get on the phone and chat them up. Plus, I have my own fascination with the culture. I've even been to a few furry conventions myself. The tougher part was all the research into the different fursuits and fursonas. Besides spending 80 plus hours coming around on the interwebs, I watched quite a few movies and documentaries. It's not a big deal when it's a subject you're actually interested in. 80 hours? You did 80 hours of research. What did you learn that was incorporated into the series? As far as I can tell, you just know what a fursona and a fursuit are? Am I missing something else? Was it Levi? Did you do 80 hours of research just to write a messy character that's around for less than half of one issue? I'm genuinely confused here. Oh, and I have a bone to pick with furry documentaries. Don't get me wrong, with how shitty people can be about furries, it's refreshing to watch something that's pleasant and supportive. It's just that all the ones I've seen come across as... inauthentic. In an attempt to appease the normie daytime television crowd, coverage tends to stay very surface level. We're told that there are just people who really like to dress up as animals. And then maybe there's an interview with a fursuit maker that details how labor-intensive their art is, followed by delightfully cringe footage of two human beings in costumes petting each other. These things on their own aren't wrong, but presenting them in isolation often feels like overly defensive damage control, where a harmful mistruth is replaced by a tolerable one. Emphasis is placed on self-expression, but there's a failure to dig deeper about why these people feel such a need to express themselves here, and what societal forces are keeping them from doing so elsewhere. In other words, audiences don't come away from these documentaries with a clear concept of where furries sit in relation to wider queer culture. Since it is nearly Halloween when I asked these questions, what is your go-to Halloween movie? The pressure is on with this question. I feel I need to have some witty pick to let my fellow horror fans know I'm one of them. But the thing always scares the pants off me. Oh man, I really wish you'd run with that. One of the genuinely upsetting things about fursuits is the anonymity they provide. Imagine the horror of slowly realizing over the course of an evening that the German Shepherd you've been hanging out with all night isn't actually your friend anymore, but someone, or something, else. You try to warn your friends, but no one believes you. And as the party stretches past midnight, it's increasingly unclear who among you is genuine and who may have been replaced. 
Now that's a furry horror story. Murder and gore seem to be in all the work that you do. What makes these elements work for your kind of storytelling? For me, I like the visceral reaction murder and gore triggers. I know it's an unusual storytelling element to incorporate, but what can I say? It fits Daniel and me's style. Murder and gore are unusual storytelling elements to incorporate? In horror? How do you say that with a straight face? That murder and gore are unusual in a horror story? Was he being sarcastic? I feel like I'm losing my mind. I own physical copies of the entire run of Walking Dead. What do you what do you think happens in that series? Is is, is the Walking Dead a deep cut? I'm suddenly reappraising this very strange scene where Devin is writing something on the ground and Bo is looking over his shoulder and he's taken aback by how extreme Devin is. Oh, damn, man. I, that's some seriously pent up shit right there. You have no idea. So, what do you think it is? Remember, he's a man who was cheated on, drugged, beaten by the police, and has now run away with a cabal of man-eating furries. What does a man who's truly on the edge say to the guy that ruined his life? What could make even a cannibal raise a brow? Fuck you. Wow. I wonder if either one of us will ever have a story that goes too far. We always share our ideas with each other, expecting that one of us might say it's too crazy, bloody, or strange, but that's never been the case. So far, at least. Oh my god, this is what normies think is edgy, isn't it? This is what they think riding the line looks like? Like they're testing the limits of the human psyche. I, I guess I was doomed from the start then, because not only have I experienced a lot of actually upsetting horror content, but I've also spent half my life looking at the stuff that actual furries have come up with. I've seen things you wouldn't believe. You wanna talk cannibals? Oh, we've got Vor. Entire people being swallowed whole, where the predator is left with a massive, squirming gut, packed with live prey. There's a loud belch, and a wet skull clatters to the floor. Characters have been merged together, robbed of their sense of individuality, as they're forced to live out the rest of their lives in a shared body. I've seen comics where some poor soul is strapped down to a table and pumped full of air as their belly strains and groans until it finally pops in a shower of gore. A hundred foot dragon smiles down at you with malicious intent as his paw descends, blotting out the world. The fur on your arms falls out in clumps as scales spread across your body. Encased in latex, you lie, immobilized, just as likely to be used as you are to be discarded, like furniture. I've seen a wolf taken over entirely by slugs that enter through every possible orifice, infesting his body and mind so that he might be used as a host to hunt down his friends. And the thing about furries is, well, at least some of us are into it. Happy Halloween. Hey, hey, don't click off the video yet. We're not done. So first of all, here we got Zek. He was our like unofficial mascot for the video. Thank, thank you so much for you went above and beyond. I was like, hey, can you be like slightly creepy in a fursuit? And he learned to, to make gore. So, so this video has been, an, has been an adventure. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> and before I lose you, I got new merch, which he's also wearing in this picture right here. It's the, the shirt I was wearing in this video. They're for sale. And I want every single one of you to go subscribe to Knoll Playing Games. That's our new tabletop RPG actual play channel where we play furry tabletop. And season one is airing right now. Season two is coming up. There's going to be gay cowboys. You want you want to miss gay cowboys? It's on you. <laughs> Bro, kid, kid, what's your sub count here? What? You know what mine is? 110. I know it sounds fucking crazy. This isn't a joke. I, I have no idea what the fuck is going on. At least he did get to say you love her. Hopefully not for the last time. Why the hell do you think anything good comes from finishing the game? Batman was an orphan, did you know that? Do you think you've got what it takes to take down the hero of Southpaw? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get those gay cowboys. That's the dumbest thing I ever said. Uh, <laughs> I'll fix. I'll fix it in post.
I'm acting. Look at me doing it. I'm doing an acting right now. Okay. Ha <laughs> ha. At the risk of embarrassing myself. What are the chances of that? <laughs> I've got beans, apparently. That's what my life has become. Yeah.